I'm a cigar man. You want to ask me technical questions? Cigars are my thing. Oh, so uh, just, uh, just have been since I was young, and I make silver cigar ashtrays. And and do you make the cutters? We were we were actually talking about this no. um, earlier. Not what kind very of cutters do you use? Yeah, very specialized. I mean, I use a, I, I use the tools that are on my desk. There's one. There's a scalpel blade. I use my pen knife uh, right there. That's what I cut my cigars with. And uh, unless it's a torpedo cigar, then I get a cutter out. But cutting cigars is, is, is a specialized thing. And they're not all expensive cutters. All yeah. of my cutters are inexpensive. Mm. My cigar ashtrays are very expensive. But um, yeah, that's, does, that's does, the ash, does the ash give uh, the silver a kind of a patina or do, does it? Uh, does it, it does. Have... It, 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 silver can react to it and go black, just the oxide. That's what it is. It's the oxygen reacting within the silver and that can go black. And sometimes it can go brown. It just depends on the smoke and, and on the acidity, but easy to clean off. Very easy to clean off. And uh, cleaning of silver is a big thing. Cleaning of silver is an important thing that we should discuss, actually, yeah. uh, because it really, it really revitalizes people's interest. All silver tarnishes. They take it from me. There are certain mixes of tarnish-free silver, but quite frankly, in the world of serious silver, you're not finding people making a lot of that. There are also coverings, platings, varnishings, things to protect, surfaces to protect the oxygen getting into the silver and tarnishing it. But those are short-lived. All right. Bottom line with silver, you've got to clean it. And it's lovely and it's beautiful and it, it gets, it, you know, treated properly gets more beautiful. Adds to it. It's, uh, it's like leather, good wood, just increases in beauty yeah and and everyone should learn how to do it everybody in this lockdown should be doing a little bit to clean their silver even if it's with soap and hot water hot water is the big trick if you're using a foam to clean silver hot water always hot accelerates the reaction of the cleaner on the silver and then wash down with a soapy sponge that's what you need to be doing. I, really, Patrick, is it as simple as that? You don't need um, specialized polishes or anything like that because I was always under the impression that you would, <clears throat> one would you know, you, you don't bring a knife to a gunfight, you would bring polish to polish. There's, to there's no doubt. If you, there's no doubt you can be more complicated than that. And when you're doing it on a big scale, if we're doing a table centerpiece uh, and there's a massive, there's a massive uh, a number of pieces to be done. Then we'll take it on in a serious way and immerse the pieces in silver cleaning solutions. We will spray them with steam sprays to get into every nook and cranny. Sure, you can go that way, but there's a huge amount of silver that, that is cleanable in home. Just takes a little bit of time and a bit of patience. And also say in our business with those table pieces that we do or small pieces or pieces of jewelry in every one of our shops, what we have the people who will clean the silver there. Or we will send people, we will send people internationally, we'll send people to America, we'll send people to Russia just to clean somebody's silver table. They might say, a table needs a cleaning, a silver centerpiece needs a cleaning, can you send someone and bang. We fly them over there. We look after it just like if you had a nice car and it got serviced, we give it the same respect as that. We'll service it. And we service it for free. So I tell you what, Patrick, I'm going to, I'm going to uh, turn myself off now and I'm going to hand over to Vanessa. Um, Vanessa, uh, as I, as I um, will just... Uh, a bit louder now. We've got to go. Oh, yes, no. Everybody joining. How am I going to get, how am I gonna get, gonna get to the setting? Hey? You'll have to go off it and come back to, yeah. the, to first do the setting. Hey? The setting. <laughs> Sorry, I beg your pardon. So that'll, that'll happen every now and again. I've just got to run around and mute. That's why I'm going to be, be quiet so I can concentrate.
hand over to Vanessa. Um, Vanessa, uh, we've got a very special guest and we must thank you incredibly for putting us in touch um, with Patrick and bringing him, bringing oh, him to our schools. We've had some wonderful guests and I'm really excited about this one. Patrick, yeah. thank you so much for joining us. And Vanessa, over to you for our introductions and uh, our, our Zoom talk about with uh, Patrick Mavros today. Thank you very much. Thanks, Matt. Will you, will you drive the presentation? Yeah. Okay. I, you know, Patrick doesn't really need any introductions. I don't think there is a person who's been to Zimbabwe or hasn't been to his shops who doesn't know who he is. So, Patrick, what I thought was interesting was we've got a piece of silver coming up in May. Uh, maybe Matt can open it. And when I sent this to you, you said, oh my goodness, that's really one of the early pieces. Um, and it's dated 2000. So could you tell us a little bit about that lovely root and tree and clip springer? Thank you. Hi, Vanessa. Nice to see Hello. you. Thank <laughs> Hello, you very Patrick. much for asking me to be here and having a chat about my silver. Ah. So I'm speaking to you from, uh, from my office oblique studio in Zimbabwe, where we're uh, under a little bit of a lockdown. And uh, we call it Fort Mavros around here, family does. Mm -hmm. uh, but mm -hmm. it's given us a huge amount of opportunity to, to look at things and uh, revisit some of our designs because my sons are involved in the business. And now back to this tree, which really excites me. And I'm gonna tell you about this tree that you have coming up on auction. It's, it's called the root tree. And uh, this tree, was the culmination Sorry. 35 years ago probably of the work that I had started doing. So I'm untrained and uh, really working very hard with no qualifications, making a lot of mistakes uh, to produce pieces in silver. And uh, what I had done was I'd actually produced a, a little family of elephants to go down the dining room table. And then one day I was sitting there and I, you know, had this aspiration that there, there should be a tree, there should be a candle cone. These little alleys should be walking under candlelight. The candle should be putting off light, which will go through, be diffused by the leaves through the tree onto the alleys. That's what I thought. So I made this, this little candlestick. And because everything was on a budget, big time budget in those days, I made the original, I don't know if you remember those thin candlesticks, you thin wax, like the size of a pencil. Okay. I do indeed, so, yeah. Uh, the first holder, you remember that. So that's what I designed it for. Uh, also because uh, the way this developed was also a little bit of a love story. So I wanted the candle to burn down quicker than a normal candle, so to speak. <laughs> And, uh, <laughs> and anyway, there was this thin candle. Then what should I put? We had elephants. What should I put on this? And then because there was love involved and I was newly married to my wife, Katja, I thought, let's put on a pair of clip springer. Why mm -hmm. clip springer? Because my friend Peter Johnson, the famous South African wildlife photographer and author and character, once took photographs of a clip spring of pear that went into the, the Guinness Book of Records, I think 1976, as the closest couple in the animal kingdom. The mates never leave each other for more than about five meters. And I just thought, can you imagine going to the Guinness Book of Records to see your pal's photograph of a clip springer pair. And I thought, clip springers never leave their mate for more than five meters. I'm gonna do it. So now we had the candlestick and I went and sculpted a little male clip springer. who has a pair of horns. There he is, there's his shape. That distinctive shape and his little ballerina toes like that put in there. So if we get a binoculars and we're looking at the copy, we're going to find his mate within five meters. And there I made the mate, the little girl. Look at her. 
pretty, lying down, recumbent with all her legs and all the detail under her feet and her ballerina toes. And we put her under there. And that was the, the first root tree, the first little love tree. And then uh, just, I got bigger candles, so I made a little bit of a bigger candle holder. And the dinner went on a little bit longer. But there we go. That was the story of those root trees. And I see there's one coming up on your auction. Eclipse yeah. trees. That is really a big time, uh, a big time creation from inspired by love, inspired by uh, Peter Johnson's great photograph in the Guinness Book of Records. It's just a wonderful story for me. It was the beginning in my life of, of table centerpieces, which, which are now something that I spend a huge amount of my time creating and, and the most fascinating pieces. And then the, 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 other, the other root trees there, there's a pair of them with drinking elephants. The two little elephants there are drinking. Two bulls. The old Man. tusker down on his knees. He's got down near the lakeside. Probably wherever it is, water hole, he's got down on his knees like this to drink with his big tusks coming out. And he's sucking the water off the table. So it looks like you, you could spill water from a vase of flowers for you spill wine. That guy's going to drink it. That's where his trunk is on the table, slurping it all up. And standing next to the old boy, slightly higher, as you see on that picture is the younger bull, the Askari, which is Swahili for policeman. The young bull who's looking after the old timer. I love that respect. Great African respect. Younger guy looks after the old boy. The young guy's taking his, he's taking his fill and he's squirting it in his mouth like that. So that's the, that's the story behind those uh, candlesticks. And, and they're and made Patrick? in sterling silver, yeah. Yeah, I was just gonna say, you seem to have changed your assaying technique because the earlier examples have got a title um, and the later examples really, they have your, uh, your, your mark, 925, and obviously the assay mark. Yes. To begin with, so, to begin with it, it's amazing that you had titles for all of your early pieces. Yes, yes. In fact, <laughs> the, the later ones, are probably a little bit bigger. Somewhere in there, you're gonna find a title. Somewhere yeah. in there. But you're right about the, the marks, and the marks are very interesting when it comes to sterling silver. First of all, uh, Zimbabwe has its own sterling silver mark, awarded to it by the Goldsmiths Hall in London in 1923. Why 1923? Because that's when, as a colony, we were given self-governing status. And the Standards Association was tasked with marking silver or assaying the silver. And the mark is a sable antelope head, sable antelope head in profile within a triangle. And that was given to the assay department of Southern Rhodesia. And that mark is the mark we still use to this day. And I'm going to tell you, if you don't mind, Vanessa, I'm going to tell you about mm. Hallmarks because it's an interesting story. Mm. Absolutely. It's 600 years old, just over 600 years old, with the then King John or King Henry of Great, King Henry of Great Britain, the United Kingdom, was being done in by his jewelers and his coin makers and his metallurgists. They weren't being 100% upfront with him on the purity of his gold or the purity of his silver. So he imported from the area now known as Eastern or was known as Eastern Germany. He imported a community of metallurgists 600 years ago, brought them to Great Britain and he had them assay his metal and come up with standards. And those standards are still here today for sterling silver. Why is it called sterling silver? It's called sterling silver because the metallurgists came from an area where they were known as oersterlings. Oersterlings in the word sterling. And those oersterlings decided 
on 92.5%, 925 parts of silver in a thousand parts. And the balance today is most commonly copper. So sterling silver is a minimum of 925 parts in a thousand and the balance is copper. And then those pieces were assayed in the halls of Nottingham, Birmingham, Edinburgh, Sheffield, London. They were assayed in the halls and marked in the halls with those all marks, hence all marks. So that's it in a nutshell. So now in Zimbabwe to this day, all of these silver pieces have samples taken from them. They go to the the assay office, they are analyzed, we get reports on them, and then I, as the maker, can proceed and mark those pieces. So they're marked with a sable antelope head, with a PM in an oval, which for Patrick Mavros, which is registered in the Goldsmiths Hall in London, and then finally with the international date stamp. And I've said so okay. much about marks now, I've forgotten what the date is, the letter. <laughs> but <laughs> it's up to date. Yeah, um, the ball mark punch makers in England will send them out every year, and that's what we'll punch into our silver. So that's how we mark. And then I'll sign Patrick Mavros, or if it's one of my sons, Forbes, Alexander, Benjamin, Patrick Jr., their signature will go on a generally Harari. We love that bit that we're getting to where we get to with Harari and the date written on there. And, uh, and sometimes, very occasionally, a little hidden secret note to the owner of the commission or the piece, uh -huh. you know, like, thanks for, saving my, thanks for saving my payday this month or something, <laughs> some, you know, something that some artist would write. <laughs> um, Pat yeah. Patrick, uh, moving on to... Uh, material which we don't see you using but i just introduced it because strauss and company really in the secondary market and this is this charming pair of hippos but yes. it's not a, it's not a material that you use anymore but i just wanted you to see um the secondary market and we're, we're achieving quite yes. in interesting prices obviously not the same as retail yes. but that's what we've been building up over the last 10 years so if we move on, Matt, to the table lamps. Yeah. And you can see that these achieved an incredible result. And they I'm also say something about that previous, that previous lot of yours there, that yeah. tiny pair of ivory hippos. Of yes, course, we yes, no yes. longer we no longer work in ivory and I haven't. That's yeah. why I got the silver, because in the right. early 80s. Some 35 years ago, we put that to bed. But what that that particular pair of of uh, hippos, uh, as you know, Vanessa went to a, a very wonderful old couple who were great patrons of the arts, and Absolutely. in their in their collection, yeah, in their collection was a lot of Oriental art and a lot of Japanese art, and they had a number of netsuke, Japanese netsuke. Mm -hmm. So what you have there is I took those two small pieces, which are just slightly larger than, the, than golf balls, and carved them in the Japanese fashion. And that has really, really affected my work. The discipline that they put into their work, whether it was carved in ivory, carved in ebony, carved in staghorn, carved in coral, Whatever they used, those master carvers, there was absolute discipline. They, the eyes were three different, in those tiny little hippos there, the eyes yeah. were three different colors of horn, two different mm -hmm. colors of cow horn and one black buffalo horn pupil. If you turned any of those pieces over on their back, their side, every toe was there in detail. The soles of the feet, the folds of the skin. And that really set me off on the detail because one of the things that to this day I'm totally, we are totally disciplined about as a family business is detail. So if we're working on a clip springer or we're working on a little elephant like this, I can assure you that the underside of the feet get as much attention as anything else. There's front feet on an elephant around. The back feet on an elephant are oval shaped. 
the front feet have four toes. The back feet have three toes. Or all of these details. And that all comes from studying early Japanese work, mm -hmm. particularly Netsuke, and respecting their tradition. So that was a, a very mm -hmm. interesting uh, early part in my career. And I've taken what I learned from that now into silver. And, uh, and it's just, you know, it's, it's mm -hmm. very, very exciting. And whatever you pick up, turn over, turn around. It's the same as the table piece, the same as this piece over here. Um, everybody who's looking at it, take the monkey lamps that you've got up now. Those monkey lamps, same story. It doesn't matter what angle you're looking at them from. There's something interesting. Sorry, I'm talking too much. Did you want to no, ask that's me about the monkey what, lamps? No, it's wonderful. That's absolutely wonderful. Uh, we we've, we've got these fantastic guinea fowl, which of course you yes. I think you're still producing. Are you still producing yes. these? Yes. Unfortunately, please can I say please can I say something them. about the monkey lamps? Oh yes, yeah, of course you can. Yeah. So so Matt? you know, I know there's just too many stories to tell, but the the thing about the monkey lamps, I wanted a lovely table lamp, and I wanted a table lamp that. Uh, that could go really on a gentleman's big table in his study or his office. In fact, I wanted a lamp on either side of his table, you see. And, uh, and they're, they're a top dollar lamp, as you can see. They're, they're, they're big lamps, Absolutely. tall lamps, huge amount of work. They've got three vervet monkeys in them. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking to myself, what is one of these big businessmen need in his life you know he needs a bit of a he needs a he needs a smile he needs something to smile about so if you look at the picture of those lamps there you will see there a monkey leaning down and he's actually stealing something off the table that's what he's doing he's stealing a <laughs> pen off the table and then the monkey in the middle he's hanging he's a lookout all right he's the look he's he's the thief's side man he's the artful dodger and and he's on the and he's standing there like those verbert monkeys do with their legs apart showing themselves off and he's looking out into the distance at any minute and he's going oh 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 you know you can just see what he's going to do in alarm so now we've got mr big old executive here uh smiling at least and then his wife's going to walk through the door and she's going to say how much did that cost you and, then he's, and then, he, then he's stuck, isn't he? The, guy's, the guy is stuck because she's going to tell him about everything from a new yoga mat to a, you know, herb garden to whatever that he didn't sponsor for. So she said, how much did it cost you? And he's going to say, darling, I bought it for you. Because if you look at the little monkeys on the top, the utmost monkeys, it's a mummy looking after a baby. And that's all I like to look at. It's a tribute to you and your motherhood and your wivelyhood and all the rest of it. So that's the story to that monkey lamp. And, and, and to get three monkeys looking good, what I did was I zigzagged that, I zigzagged that tree um, to, so that it gave it some delicacy instead of, you know, three monkeys um, hanging off the branches. Yeah, you can see that. And it's beautifully textured. So they, were, they were incredible, these. They were a beautifully textured tree and this Thank fantastic you. base. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. No, they were terrific. Yeah. You want to go to the next? Thank you. Uh, the, yes, please. The Gifa. Unfortunately, yes. these didn't, didn't have their mealies, which I know that ah, when you normally sell them, right. they come with mealies. <laughs> They were lost. Yes, yes. <laughs> but, but Big inspiration. Be got to tell you, we've got guinea fowl in our country, as you know. Yeah. Uh, big inspiration came from, from my friends in South Africa uh, um, with Agred, African Game Bird Research and Development. I, I couldn't name all those great characters who inspired me there. The World Authority on Guinea Fowl, Professor Tim Crow in Cape Town. All of these great characters, the Peter Johnsons, the whoever, the Eugene Halsteads, all of these people, this massive, enthusiastic group of people saying, Patrick, why don't you make uh, 
uh, our guinea fowl, helmeted guinea fowl. Why don't you make them? And, and there I had this collection of men who studied guinea fowl. And, uh, and all of them, and people who photographed it, it was a wonderful community of people uh, that I was exposed to. And what, one of my big things is silhouette. Silver does not reflect anything but light. When you look at something silver, bang, it's the most reflective metal in the world is silver. So and for, it's not a bronze where I can look in and see the spots. It's, 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 it's not a wood carving where I can look at patina to show me shadowing of muscles. So you better get your silhouette right when you start working in silver. And that's what I think those three guinea fowl capture. You just look at their silhouettes and you know straight away that those things are guinea fowl. And you look at their legs, their top, their wattles, every, their positions, absolutely characteristic positions. And as you say, I had some little mealy pips which are under that mm. pecking bird. That lady pecks up the maize and, uh, and he's on the lookout. Look at that big old boy looking out. He's taking a look mm. over the flock there. And the other one's moving on to greener pastures. Uh, all the spots on those guinea fowl, this, Vanessa, this is interesting. All the spots on the guinea fowl are in raised relief. In other words, in the wax, mm. I added them to the surface of the wax guinea fowl. Every single spot, and spots are different. Some around the neck are round. When you get down to the flanks down here, those are rectangular spots. You go and have a look next time you see a guinea fowl. So that made, why did I make them raised? I made them raised so that as that guinea fowl gets older on your dining room table, as it gets older, that collection or your mantelpiece, yeah. and you go and rub it down, you rub the surface, what's going to shine out white? The raised spots. So you're going to see the spots. What's going to be darker? The recess, the surface of the bird. So that bird's going to look more like a guinea fowl the older it gets. And these are heirloom pieces now. That's what these are. These, these, these for me are very, very important. We've, we've captured something in Africa, particularly timely, in silver. And, uh, you know, th these are for generations. That's where I look at them. You go overseas, you'll see all sorts of things on tables, pheasants and ducks and what have you. Well, we've done this yeah. to, to African game birds. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the Victorians had all sorts of birds on their tables. And yes. I think, yeah, this is absolutely for us living in the yeah. 21st century. They're beautiful. Thank you. And, and excuse yes. me, their feet. Yes. I always yes. say, yeah, the feet <laughs> are guinea fowl's feet. They are not a Swainson's Franklin's foot or a, some other foot. It's a guinea fowl's foot. So if you take that foot and push it into the cold butter on the dining table, move it away and call your tracker through to have a look and analyze. He will say, that is a guinea fowl's foot, you see. Uh -huh. So there's a very and faithful too. reproduction of details. Absolutely. Amazing. Um, we've got these fantastic photographs of your studio. So when, when I visited you two years ago, um, you were in the process of producing the most extraordinary table setting of, of manta rays. Am I right? And I, Correct. Is that, yeah. Manta rays. Absolutely yes. extraordinary. So I'm guessing that that is really the, um, these are the wax molds. Those are the wax models. Yeah. Exactly. That was a commission. That was a commission by um, a lady for her husband's birthday. And, uh, and her husband loves manta rays and uh, spends a huge amount of time in the Chagos Archipelago in the Indian Ocean, right? And uh, she asked for manta rays on her dining room table. She, 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 she needed four and a half meters of manta rays. Now, every time I sculpt something, I go and do some serious research. 
at, if I'm sculpting guinea fowl, I research. If I'm sculpting a Seiko falcon, I'll go to the Middle East and study the Seiko falcon or a polar bear. But one thing you are not going to get me to study is anything that lives in the deep ocean. I am terrified. All right. So, so this man, all right, unbeknown to him, had his library of movies looted by his wife. Okay, hours and hours of diving with manta rays. It was wonderful. And I spent, uh, I spent 14 months, a year and two months on this project, sculpting these manta rays in different positions. And what I uh, decided was uh, to, to have these manta rays come sweeping over the one end of the table sweeping low hunting and you can see it you can you you can almost feel it in the race streamline cutting through the through the sea and uh, above the sand and there they'd come and then of course they'd rise as they got to the center of the table when they hit their prey and once they did that then those big manta wings would fold up and those long tails would curl and there was a vortex of swirling manta rays, mouths open, gills getting rid of water, diving back in again, and then dropping off towards the end of the table where the feast was finished. And they were suspended there by, by silver, models of silver kelp that I did that uh, suspended these birds. And then just uh, to, to light them, no high candles. All the candles were low, made, made for me by my son, Forbes in Mauritius. These were sea, in sea urchins and in the sand, little tea lights, low down. So if you walked into this blackened dining room, you just saw the tea lights shimmering, shimmering along the full length, four and a half meters of swimming manta rays, each of them the size of my 20, four manta rays and it just shimmered and it looked like they were going through the water and it also reflected on the on the eyes the little sapphire tiny very discreet nothing flashy sapphire eyes that they had so you had the shimmering light coming up underneath the mantra as you know mantra is matte on its back and it's white on its belly so the silver once again watch that silver you've got to really make sure that it's very white on the chest and highly polished and then on the black on the back it's textured and darkened so all of these contrasts of colors with every now and again a little glint of a blue eye as the swim and that that's the story of the uh of the manta rays which we're also happy with i must say they were a feat of engineering as well they were quite extraordinary thank you Thank you. Uh, we've got this wonderful photograph, Matt, of your silversmiths. T you tell us a little bit about them, because I believe right. they're all trained. They're all your, trained by you. Correct. So what we've got here, really, it is. It's just a, it's a lovely photograph. And my family have been here since the 1890s, and uh, mainly in farming, sometimes mining whatever else, activities, medicine, et cetera. But we've had a great rural life here and have been associated with families for a, for a number of generations, up to four generations. And all the chaps that work with me have to have the same qualifications I have, which, which are close to that. All right. And so it makes, it makes it easier for anyone to come and join my team. What you got to do is you got to be able to work hard and you got to have integrity. And I say that to everybody, all those people who might be watching, who have children who don't know what to do, but mommy, I'm artistic, or do I need to do art, do I whatever. Stop whinging and whining and do the job. If you want to do art, do the art. Get stuck into it, but there are rules. Work hard at it and be successful at it. And the harder you work, the more success, the more fun it becomes, and the more you can do with yourself. So many people are artistic and they don't realize it. You've got to have discipline. 
So all the chaps that you work, there are now two generations of people who are working in our business. Imagine, I grew up on a farm out there catching squirrels with Zwieden Yamaraka, who's uh, with me, founded the business, Bill John Katagura. We've now got the young Yamarakas working with my sons. And you've got Colin Katagura working with my sons. And each man is a specialist. He might be a specialist wax worker. He might be a spe specialist on wood. He a uh, specialist caster, jeweler. Uh, and everybody lives on this estate. So the, there's a big village on this estate. That's why we call Fort Mavros under lockdown. And uh, everyone has their activities, etc. But it's a, this is a unique family business. When you say family, it's family. All problems here, huge, huge amount of respect uh, paid to a cultural history, tradition, etc. here uh, on our place and in our community generally. So um, I'm very proud of that picture and, and all the guys in there. Yes, my poor man, King Jack. So uh, well done, keep it up. And I'm waiting for the third generation. That's what I want to see. I want to see the third generation because that's called success. Yeah. I love the fact that they're holding those beautiful masasa trees. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, we've got this, this, the, the next slide is, is, is Matt, is you and your working studio where we, we're photographing now. Yes. Yes. And you've got all these interesting objects in the studio. You've got everything oh. here. You've got a wrapped present on the right hand side. And yeah. you've got yeah. um, yes. ivory teeth, you've got spears, you've got buckets. Yes, all you've my got tools. Everything. All your toys, reference Yeah, books. my toys, my tools, and my pens, all my failures, a lot of mistakes here. I want to tell you, I'm the king of mistakes. And, uh, but another thing is, you know, th this is fascinating because there is interesting stuff here. I mean, cultural objects, I mentioned cultural and traditional. Zimbabwe is a very, very small country. People must understand it. And gold was the big industry. Gold was mined here in this country for a thousand years before people like my great, great grandparents came to colonize. That's what this place was all about. Gold. No silver is mined here. Silver is a byproduct of the gold refining business. But so much of these, these articles like this here, which I'm going to get to, uh, this is a headdress, Mutsago. But it, it's, a, it, it's very special in what these inscriptions are because this is a conduit for someone to speak and communicate with their ancestral spirits. And what's written here is called Nyora, which is Nyora is the Shona word for right. And there's a, mm -hmm. there's a huge significance in what this says. Just like in some of our ladies in our country have Nyora, these little scarifications on their face or on their chest or on their hips. That's called Nyora. That's a very, very private thing. And you can imagine uh, the you can imagine what it was like with the stigma that was brought upon it by by uh, people who came to this country, and yet it was a very very advanced type of artwork that was performed on, on these ladies by aunts and mothers for the woman. It was the woman's most private story for her husband. Yes, and you can read about it, Nyora. And we're going to produce a range of jewelry called Nyora. And it's going to be about the most private messages of a lady to her man. Now that's respect and enrichment. That's what I want to say. Enrich. You don't have to buy anything we make. I promise you, you come and visit this place, you're going to leave enriched. If it's this office, mm -hmm. you're going to learn all about wherever the first knob carry that I ever bought in my life as a boy, as a 12-year-old schoolboy, and I've, hence the, the, the big collection of spears, Batonka spears from, mm. from the Zambezi River, Batonka stools, all of them genuine articles, many of them with stories, stories about, say, my grandfather, a chap called Sir Patrick Fletcher, who was the Minister of Native Affairs. 
in the early 50s telling the Batonka people that the big Zambezi River is going to be dammed at a place called Kariba and their dwellings and homesteads are going to be flooded and they had to move. And he was sitting there and in his audience was Chief Mola, Chief Binga, and a spirit medium who told him that he could take his fancy idea and his dam and his people and get back to England she, because the river got yummy, yummy. Can you imagine this going on? A grandfather standing there in a pith helmet being rebuked by this woman in bones, the spirit medium. And she said, you're going to get eaten and defeated and eaten by Nyami Nyami, the river god. And she ran straight off the bank that they were standing on into the Zambezi River and disappeared. Well, you know, all of this plays a part in your life, certainly in my creative life, in our family's creative life, this history of our deep, rich history. We take things like that Mutsago seriously. Also, this little item, the spiral whirl called Ndoro, that there is highly revered. And I told you about the gold. When the yeah. Portuguese came to this part of the world, believe me, they came for the gold. But they couldn't buy it with their metacash and their escudos. The people of this country, my country, where the rivers flowed with gold, wanted Ndoro. That is a marine. That's a marine shell from Conus Virgo. Conus Virgo, cone shell, but the pure white one. There it is there. This was so highly prized, so highly prized that the Portuguese had them replicated in Goa, their colony called Goa. They replicated these pieces, brought them back by the shipload, and then bought all the gold from the Zimbabweans through the Mozambican and Arab traders who had set up all these little merchant fortresses along the Zambezi River and the Hanyani River and the Mazoe River, etc. I started to make those into earrings, miniature ones, little dangle ones, pendants, tinier, smaller, with the story. And two things happened. Everyone who got hold of these got a booklet on what it is, Ndoro of Zimbabwe. They were enriched. They learned what this was. Even the people of Zimbabwe who didn't know or had forgotten their own history learned what it was. So you don't leave this place without feeling enriched that you've learned something. And respect is paid. Once again, respect back into the culture. And, and some very, very well-known people started to wear those things. And bingo, it got around. So more people know about Ndoro. I love it. I love the journey you, you take through these different places from Portuguese looking for gold and how, and these Andoros, by the way, exactly that spot. This one comes from, uh, hang on, there's a dog chasing the goose out there. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> oh, uh, all right, sorry about that. There's, no, that's uh, all right. There's some uh, Egyptian geese out there and my cocker spaniels are uh, getting out of hand. Anyway. There we go. So, <laughs> small interruption on the Andoro, on the Andoro story on the banks of the Zambezi River. Yes. Sorry, Vanessa. Not at all, Patrick. We, you know, that is your your wonderful working space. Um, yeah. I included this uh, slide because I thought it was quite interesting. You have got all these different types of wine coasters because I know you're very involved with the dining room table from candlesticks to these fantastic wine coasters. And I yes. thought it was interesting that you could see the Jorg Jensen, yes. which is actually, it's a 2008 example. So it's originally designed by him at the beginning yes. of the 20th century. Um, and then there's a very nice pair of George III silver wine coasters, all very similar in their, price range but very interesting mm -hmm. designs of each way each one of you have uh, committed an interesting rendition to the sides if you like the enclosing borders yeah 
do, yeah, and do those elephants do they all have names because most of your no. elephants have got no. yes most of my elephants have names and they 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 are from from uh, genuine elephants and a number of them the big tuskers are from south africa shawu yeah. shingwedzi you see name mafunyani names like this of elephants that I, I've since replicated in silver, but those elephants on that wine coaster do not have names. And what they're doing, there's a little story there, because there's a, uh, and I'm very honored to be, to be uh, telling you this in, in, with my work alongside those of great masters. I've got to tell you, because I, I always, I, and you've honored me, Vanessa, thank you, because I always, wished that uh, in my career that maybe someone would uh, put me close to one of these guys, not all the way, but certainly close to one of these famous silversmiths. And now you've done it. You're the first person who's done it. And I say thank you to you. And now I'll tell you about my elephants. So if you look closely on that little wine coaster, you will see that there's a tree and in the tree are little marulas. Now what's happening is those elephants have been eating the marulas, and as all of us Southern Africans know, they've been fermenting away. Elephants have got a bit tipsy, and uh, they're a little bit all fall down. One's collapsed on his front, uh, on his front uh, uh, legs over there, and uh, one is rubbing his backside on an anthill, and. Uh, and that's made him very happy, uh, rubbing his, in his backside. And uh, there's another one there having a, having a little play with, having a little play with, uh, with another one of the elephants, as you can see. That's what I can see from here. So that, this is a little bit of a little bit of a spicy, uh, spicy wine coaster, if you take a close look. But otherwise, apart from that, it's just a very nice piece to have on your table. And I like table pieces because they give okay. people things to talk about. They so do. So there we go. So if we go to the next slide, which is this beautiful table setting. And that's in your gallery overlooking yes. the yes. Amwinsdale area. Correct. Tell us a little bit about, about where, where it's overlooking which mountains. Well, Overlooking the Amwinzi, the Amwinzi River, which looks mm -hmm. out over the Mutoko Hills, the big granite batholiths of Mutoko. There's a lot of greenery up there right now, but that subsides in winter, and you've just got this fabulous, this fabulous view overlooking the Mutoko Hills, Mangwende. And then after the Mangwende, you will you'll go into the area known as Inyanga on our eastern boundary. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, if you could see that, well, you can't see the Nyanga from here, but you can see Mangwende. And there's a Nyanga, and then there's the flats of Mozambique. Then you run out of Mozambique after 200 kilometers and hit the Indian Ocean, and then you hit Madagascar. And after that, in a straight line, you go straight into Mauritius <laughs> and end up with another little silversmith with a name called Mavros, but that's the way it's looking. That's, oh. and it's all about views. I tell you one place that influenced me hugely on views and using views was Venice. Those chaps who built Venice, I take my hat off to them. They did not look up, down, sideways, anyway, without exploiting the beauty of a view. And I've always done that. Ever since I went to Venice, I walk around and I just look for views. Hmm. Simple as that. Big inspiration in my thatched, yeah. thatched okay. rondable. And those windows were put in there. Those I bought from a second hand, uh, from a demolition shop. And I actually put those windows in place first. That's what I did. I, I, I put them on bricks, put them up, positioned them correctly for a nice entrance. And then I built the building around the windows. That's what I did. Yeah. So yeah. let's have a look, look at some of these beautiful candles. You've got candelabra. Um, okay, right. Now those and, candelabra. And then you've got these. Next generation. Next generation. 
And then these wonderful giraffes. Yes. Yes. So the, the, the elephant candelabra uh, are a pair, you see, of yeah. cows and calves. The two cows down at the water's edge and calves, one calf playing in the mud with his trunk out and his mother stretched, balanced with her foot like they do, lifting it off. And she's about to pull him out of the mud. And then the other cow is standing over her calf and the calf's looking up about to drink from her breast. So obviously a cow elephant's breasts under her front legs. So that's the female one. And those trees, in fact, are from Kariba. Those are Mapani trees, lost their bark, been rubbed by elephants, there's footprints in the mud. And then the bull tusk, the bull uh, uh, candelabra is just my favorite. The big old Ascari drinking, uh, the big old tusker drinking, the young Ascari looking out. That's a nice pair. One of my practical, yeah. uh, lovely pair. And then, and then the of giraffes? course, we take a big step. And yeah, that that's piece, a very that, big step. that's a long piece. Yeah, that's a big step. Yeah. And that's there what I was trying to do. No, do you know, uh, yeah. Vanessa, what I do when I start is I don't, um, I don't, uh, in my, uh, when I design things, I don't put a price on it. I don't put any limitations on it. And it's probably one of the great things that we had, uh, that I had without having uh, an education was the ability to do what I wanted to do. There were, there, there were no conditions, there were no, um, there were no restrictions, limitations. I wasn't given a pound of wax and, and, and a ball of string and told to make this. I just went ahead and did it. And that is all about, that is a great example of what I'm telling you, free mm -hmm. spirit. I wanted the flat top acacia trees, that great silhouette of Africa and giraffes walking on a dining room table every tree different look similar but each one different and all of those giraffes in characteristic positions characteristic mm -hmm. positions so that's what uh, this this piece was and it's called the fiery tree collection and uh, after a lady called her name was fiery and she asked me she said uh, when you get something that you think is an everlasting impression of africa let me know and ever since then, they've just been called the fiery tree collection. They and you can, you can stretch them out. You can have a very long table and you yeah. can pull them out. Or you yep. can concertina them so that they're a forest in the middle of the table. Quite beautiful. You had the luxury you. of, you've had the luxury of time, really, to... Exactly. To yeah. Oh, absolutely. I've had the yeah. luxury of not being told what to do. Not being given a restriction. And I had great parents. My father, an absolute genius in medicine, whatever. I just thank him for not pushing me too hard. Whatever I did, if I was a soldier, be a good soldier. If I was a baker, be a good baker, son. Then I became an earring maker. Oh, my goodness. Sounded like a disaster trip. But anyway, and my mother for just helping me with, with in the world of art, you know, giving me a cockerel that I could sketch when I was a kid. Um, anyway, there we go. Now we've got some foul there. That piece that's in front of you is yeah. a North American wild turkey. That is an Eastern turkey. I was commissioned to make some turkeys for a fellow in America. All right. And I knew not, I always wanted to know why do you Americans hunt, hunt turkeys? A turkey, let me tell you, is the cleverest creature in North America. It's the smartest. It, it's like a baboon. It's got the best hearing. It's got the best smell, the best eyes, the best sense of danger, etc. People hunt those big tom turkeys because they uh, they are so elusive. And there's only way to, one way to get them, and that is to call them. You've got to pretend you're a woman. You've got to pretend you're a female. And they've got all these different calls. You've got a clock in hand. You know, that gets that old Tom shook up in the woods there. But anyway, I went to North America to study those turkeys before I made them. I actually went to the North American Turkey Convention in Nashville, Tennessee. 
And as one of the things that the North American Turkey Convention that I went, and everybody goes there, the governors go there, the senators go there, in the past presidents have gone there, right down every strata of society, the people who live in the woods in tree houses. And the big event of all the events at the North American Wild Turkey Convention is the North American Wild Turkey Carlin Competition. And that takes place in an auditorium. And a wild turkey caller, if he wins the competition, will win a boat, a four by four pickup truck, and a hundred thousand dollars. So I want to tell wow. you, competition is steep. Wow. And they go in there, <laughs> and we can't have the judges exposed to the competitors because a lot of them judges is related to the competitors, you understand? They go share the spoils. So they hide the judges under the floor. And contestants are called by numbers. Contestant number one. And there are five, six thousand people in that auditorium. Absolutely could hear a pin drop. And they'd give these noises, and everyone would look. And if anyone's cell phone went off, just, you know, shoot the guy. This was taken very seriously. Patrick Mavros, after having walked this walk, decided that he better not make any mistakes on his turkey, all right? So I came <laughs> back to Zimbabwe. I also, I also brought with me from, uh, from America uh, three stuffed turkeys um, from the North American Wild Turkey Stuffing Champion, um, Kelly Morris, and I brought those back with me, and, and I produced that turkey, and I'm very proud. It's a big tom with a beard there, and there's a there's a hen that he has that goes with it. So there's a, it's a little bit of a story. Everything's a bit uh. of an expedition, which I like. You know, there's uh. so much excitement. There's nothing corporate about this business. And uh, <laughs> which, we, we, quite frankly, it is nothing, it's a family business. And what's wonderful uh, for, you, for me to say to you is, is that how our sons, we have four sons, and they've all Matt, come into Matt. the business with, okay. with enthusiasm. Yes. And yeah. So yes. Just going back, Matt, go back a, a slide, please. Okay. So I, I think the introduction really to your family is that I thought this was quite a fun uh, slide. Yes. And I, I told you this morning that the records of the Worshipful, Worshipful Company of Goldsmiths, that there were only 63 female goldsmiths between yes. 1697 to 1860. And they were all married to the goldsmiths. Um, yes. And when the goldsmith died, they inherited the business and they normally had to marry the goldsmith's brother or they had to carry on. Um, yes. And uh, there were only 14 women that had no personal record of having a male relative in the silversmithing craft. So yes. the, the, this, if you look at the work on the right-hand side, that's the work of Anne Bateman. So she was working at the end of the 18th century and during the Georgian period, and she trained her children. So there she's working with her son, Peter. And you can see, obviously, those commissions are completely different to yours in yeah. every way. Yeah. Yeah. And the lovely salver on the left-hand side is by Elizabeth Jones, which is a similar date. Yes. But it's rather nice to have her work. And that oh, really wonderful. leads me. Yeah, and it leads me to this amazing yeah. photograph of your fantastic family. Tell us a little bit about all these gorgeous children of yours. Uh, I, I will, and I'm going to tell you very quickly what respect I have for true silversmiths. I'm not a true silversmith. I, I'm, I'm a guy who makes animals and, and some adornment in silver. Those pictures you've been showing me are absolutely beautiful. Thank you. So there's my family and uh, my beautiful wife, Katja, who I married uh, some 40 years ago. And uh, that was a love story because that's what started this, all of this business. A pair of earrings for her, uh, which I made from my hospital bed in 1978. And that's what got it going. Um, you know, it, uh, <laughs> a dispute between two shop owners in, in Borrowdale Village actually got it going because the one said, why 
uh, is she getting earrings? And, and the other one said, well, I'd like a pair of those earrings. And your wife's here. And that, that, that's how it all got going. People wanted to buy the earrings that I made for my hospital bed. And now's the result of that. You can see there, there are four sons with their wives, with grandchildren. It's fantastic. So Alexander's first. Now, all of these boys have had a great education. All got great degrees uh, in business or in art. Uh, collectively, uh, I can say that uh, the, the, they've graduated with distinction through uh, the art, art colleges, art universities, Royal College of Art in, in London, Richemont Luxury Academy, uh, Cartier Paris postgraduate master's degree, uh, all of them, they're, uh, they're just a team, and I wouldn't want to differentiate one from the other. And, uh, and then Ben, number four, also a great artist, great, great artist, but he's a farmer here in Zimbabwe. And so there they are. There they Alexander's are. in London. We have a, a store in London, and uh, Forbes is in uh, Mauritius, uh, where we have Forbes as a, an atelier where he produces. And of course, Whereas we concentrate on Africa, Forbes concentrates on the tropical, all the palm trees, starfish, sea urchins, stones, beautiful colors. Forbes' wife, Kate. Here we go, Vanessa, taking up a little bit of what you were saying of having to marry a silversmith. All right. There you go. Um, you, you understand shame. Uh, you know, I talked her into that. And now look at that. And the little beautiful little babies. And. Kate is a gemologist and a designer. And, uh, and of course, that is such a wonderful compliment for the two of them and what they create. Mm -hmm. Patrick is a highly qualified. Patrick is into E. He's into the E side of things very much, apart from being physically a great artist and a great designer. He's taking things to another generation, which, which leaves the old man standing back in the dust a little bit once in a while. And uh, the whole thing is such an exciting movement, I have to say, uh, for all of us in our design. It's, and even in this time of lockdown, I've never worked so hard. I've received more on that iPhone telling me what I've got to do, where I've got to catch up, etc. Uh, but it, it, it's wonderful, uh, absolutely wonderful to have the support of our families, uh, the way we do, brothers, sisters, cousins, is just great. So this family thing is a big story. It doesn't go uh, just as far as my immediate family goes. There are a huge number of people who are uh, an integral part of it. We, we, we love this slide. This looks like you're having such fun. And then the last slide, uh, Matt. Yes. You've got your, 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 this is what you've been doing. Um, yes. Lockdown. And, Thank you. Um, we've all loved these stories. And tell us a little bit about that beautiful all child. All right. Thank you. So there's, there's my first grandson. His name is Maximus Mavros. Maximus Matthias Mavros. And he's a very smart boy. I've come to live, emigrated from uh, United Kingdom back to Zimbabwe. And thank goodness for that. You just imagine where he was in whichever park, you know, Battersea Park or somewhere a few months ago. And uh, just the day before yesterday, he's here on the family estate, crawling over a copy with his, with his grandfather, his papu, uh, on all fours lifting up rocks and looking underneath them for scorpions. And we found, we pretending to hunt and forage like baboons. We lift up these rocks, look, and there was a big fat black scorpion. Bang. Grandfather had it by the tail and showed him and taught him a little bit about the scorpion and put the scorpion back safely under the stone and closed it. Now you just imagine the contrast. You imagine the richness of this. And this is how we all grew up. All of us grew up here in Zimbabwe like that. Our sons grew up with that enthusiasm. It sparks the imagination. And uh, it's just great. Whatever step you take for the future has got to be a strong step here. And, and I'm very proud of that. Proud of my family. Uh, 
happy to be able to do what I do. Happy that someone like you's asked me to have a chit chat with you on the on the Zoom on the Zoom tube. And, uh, <laughs> well, I I think we've all loved the. If you go onto your website, you can see these extraordinary stories that you're telling everybody every week, and that, and that they really are they're fantastic. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for joining yeah. us. And I wanted to tell you that um, possibly. You, you haven't noticed that she's watching, but Susie Johnson is actually watching you. Oh, how oh. lovely. How she's lovely. In, our, in our Johannesburg office. Oh, Hello, fantastic. Patrick. Isn't that wonderful? Thank you. Well, thanks for mentioning <laughs> that. He would be really pleased. Oh, great. Thank Hello, you. Patrick. Lovely to see you. Thank you, darling. Can you Good. Can you All righty. Nice to see you. Thanks and thanks, Matt. Thanks for joining us. You were terrific. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Right Matt, have you disappeared? Bye. Bye. And, and bye. Bye, Vanessa. Thank you so much. I look right. forward to seeing wait, wait. you. Thanks, Matt. Thank thanks, you. Susie. And just to let everybody know quickly, Patrick, um, and also to yes. you, I'll send you the link, but we, we have been recording this today. So I will be mm. making the link available for anybody that wants to get in. And just so you can send it also to your kids. And oh, family. thank you. Um, I think it'll be a wonderful, a wonderful thing to share. And uh, we yes. just think we're getting um, thanks from everybody. You might not see it on your phone, but Jacqueline yeah. says, brilliant. Thank you. She says she's got an Enduro. So um, yes. There's a shout out to the audience. Um, Ann Thompson says, thank you very much. Derek again says, great, Patrick. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. and, uh, and, uh, and we've got some enthusiasm about the recordings. As I said, I'll be getting those up. Um, so, yeah, Patrick, that was really, really wonderful. And it felt like we were privileged enough to um, have story time with you today. And uh, no. it was really incredible to hear about your journey and your wonderful objects and uh, some of the some of the conception that goes in behind that um, you know we've been saying on these zoom talks that cataloging brings things alive but when we've got when we've got the like the artist that we had on last week and when we've got the maker with us the objects really really um, uh, uh, really begin to shine and glow so it has been really thanks Matt we've got um, we've got uh, Pilene says, hello, dearest nephew, lovely interview. I don't know if that means uh, something Thank to Thank you, yes. Hello, dearest aunt, lovely aunt. <laughs> hello, Patrick, Thank you. I love you. <laughs> Thank you, darling. <laughs> Look at my lovely aunt. Lots of love to you, P. <laughs> Thank you, you too. <laughs> I think Patrick, while everybody, That's while wonderful. everybody starts logging off, uh, maybe do, do yes. you uh, give us some give us some words about um, some words of encouragement about how you see um, everybody getting down to the lockdown and you know how you've been dealing with it and how family's been so helpful um, and uh, you know. yeah thanks very much sure I will the big the, the big, big big word uh, is is patience have to have patience if you have patience you can think straight all right and if you can think straight then you're going to listen to all those basic rules simple rules we are not scientists Sim the common man must just have simple rules cleanliness hygiene distance and isolation that's it please listen to that be patient so you can absorb that be patient with your family be patient even if things are going wrong and if they're going in a bad way please be patient it's the biggest word there is as far as i'm concerned and you know, this, this, this will come to pass. I can't say when, but try have patience. That's the big story for me. Um, and be creative. Hey, if you can fill, if, if you like doing a bit of art, draw something. After all, you know, you've had three weeks to draw things or you want to decorate a cake or you, I don't know what you want to do, a flower arrangement or a bow wrapping whatever just do it do something creative do something nice for somebody just do something nice for somebody all right simple <laughs> thank you so much, Patrick. and right with that Patrick and ladies and gentlemen you are on five past five again i'm going to say a huge thank you so much to vanessa 
for conducting this interview and for bringing uh, Patrick to our shores and Patrick for Thank giving you. a wonderful hour of your time that was really entertaining and fascinating and I've learned so much and um, and uh, you know I would uh, I will definitely definitely um, uh, uh, keep a, keep an eye on keep an eye on your website and uh, and you know so my my Christmas wish list is uh, uh, definitely got some new items on it so. Great. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Matt.